Um, so we're really honored to have Tim DiFrancesco here, the founder of Athletes Edge. Uh, Tim earned the stripes as the head and strength and strength and conditioning coach for the LA Lakers from 2011 to 2017. And fun fact, uh, one of my best childhood friends played with the Lakers during part of the time when Tim was there. Um, so that that was kind of one of Tim and I's uh, connections. And then um, now Tim is my trainer. My own trainer who helps me keep keep me on the road and keep me biking and running and so right. forth. Um, Tim's journey from a doctor of physical therapy to shaping champions with the LA Lakers to now leading TD Athletes Edge showcases dedication to athletes' performance. And we're really honored to have you here today, Tim. So um, why don't I let you take it away and maybe give us a quick summary of what you what you got planned. Yeah, that's great. I really appreciate it. And thanks to everybody who for carving out time and, and jumping on here. And um, I always love any opportunity to kind of get in there and talk shop and pass along some of the uh, gems and, and nuggets that I've collected over a lot of years in the trenches of um, helping athletes, humans, and, and I'll talk about humans versus athletes in a second here uh, to, to kind of crack the code of, of durability, especially. So while I was with the Lakers, the big thing is, and as, as, as Mark made mention, players like Kobe Bryant, Steve Nash as, as the person that he was referencing there as one of his childhood friends there, and, and um, Pau Gasol were in the later stages of their career. And I really had an opportunity there to learn front and center how um, to prescribe exercise through the lens of durability, because if I didn't do that, then um, I was really doing them at that stage and in, in age of their career. Uh, a disservice. And I think it's sometimes surprising for some people to think about, well, what is the stuff that he did with Kobe Bryant or Steve Nash or Pat Gasol have necessarily to do with me? I've either never even dribbled a basketball or if I did, it was recreationally and I, I'm I'm a runner or I'm, you know, anything else. And so the funny thing is that all humans are athletes. And we have that saying here at TD Athletes Edge. And um it, uh, I think if anybody walked through our space and saw our in-person operation, you would see really quickly what I mean by that. So um, all ages and stages uh, of uh, people are, are people that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis. And the majority of our audience and who we prescribe exercise to through our methodology and through our coaching and, and guidance and programming are somewhere in the ages of 40 to 60 and are either recreational runners or like to just kind of feel better, but they, many of them have a uh, laundry list of nagging injuries or surgery histories. And as I tell everybody all the time, whether it was Kobe Bryant in his final four years, or it's Joanne who just finished her, her session on the floor with us, um, who is in her sixties and uh, wanting to feel better as she plays with her grandkids and things like that. Um, nobody is driving around a brand new car off the lot for a body. And so that's really the lens that I've delivered exercise prescription through, whether it has been Kobe, Brian, or Joanne. And I really began to realize that in the amount of people that we were working with and I was working with through TD Athletes Edge that are either recreational or even competitive runners of any level, uh, how there's kind of a little bit of an algorithm that was developing without me knowing it of how I was prescribing exercise to that specific audience. And no matter the starting points that you're at, it's all the same. And I want to get into that today. I'll, I'll stop for a minute, Mark, and, and, and go any direction you want me to. But I want to sort of uncover a little bit of a framework of how I look at specifically for runners, how to bolster yourself for the activity. So I want to get into that today. That's great. Thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, I think if we'll, we'll go ahead, maybe just if you could talk a little bit about why strength training is important for runners and um, yeah, your thoughts around that um, and how you sort of get started, why it's important. And yeah, let's go, let's go from there and see. Yeah. Where we That's such a good one. And it's funny there, <clears throat> there was always this myth that in a similar way exists between basketball players and 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 runners it's it's a little bit different in how they apply it but basketball players tend to say 
you know, hey, I, I don't want to lift too much heavy weight because it's going to mess up the form on my shot. So runners tend to separately say, well, I do all my leg work on on the when I run, so I don't I don't need the resistance training. I'm doing enough stuff. Um, so it's sort of like a little bit of a myth that each of those groups will tend to fall back on, and I would argue that each of them could kind of change that mindset and realize that the uh, foundational support beams of the activities that they're doing, whether it be jumping and dunking a basketball, shooting a jump shot, or running three miles or a mile around a track, those same uh, anatomy exists for, for both parties. And those are really from the belly button down, let's just say, are the the load bearing structures of uh, uh, of what you do when you when you do run or even walk, and um, want to get into some of that framework in a in a second. But the I think that sometimes runners assume that maybe the only reason to do this is so that uh, for in terms of resistance training is is to help me to run faster. And I'm 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 okay with my current pace, and I'm not really worried about the performance impact of of what resistance training would do because i think sometimes regardless of your activity many people just assume that resistance training is for muscles start finish end of story and i think that that's a a, a mistake basically i think that people are missing the fact that resistance training is equally if not more impactful on your bones your tendons your ligaments these are the support beams of what we do. So the muscles are the things that propel us, but the support beams are those tissues that we think of as static. We think of as they don't really change no matter what I do. They are what they are. Sometimes I have a nagging uh, tendon or ligament or bone. And if it's not nagging, then what else can I do for it? And I find this to be the most fascinating part of what resistance training can do for you. Uh, much more so in my opinion than what it can do for your muscles is what it can do for those support beam structures that many people write off as static. Um, and furthermore, a lot of people tend to get a diagnosis with an injury in one of those tissues and say, well, my, my doctor said I have um, some arthritis in my knees or my doctor said I have tendonitis and I went to PT and they did some stuff that kind of helped, but it's still lingering. What else can I really do? It's a static tissue. I mean, I, I did all the stuff. And the, the, the really fascinating piece and the part that gives me goosebumps is whether I was working with Kobe Bryant on his Achilles repair or whether we're working with Joanne on her cranky hip flexor, it, it, it doesn't matter. Those tissues absolutely can respond and become more durable, more robust um, in, in their role, which is the support beams of, of what we do. So I always want people to begin to frame why resistance training is important for runners. Running is an impact sport. It's literally hopping from one leg to another, one leg at a time on a single leg moment of time, each each step. And so that can add up. And it's typically more chronic load and, and adding up than it is when you talk about a basketball player who was in the game for five minutes and they jumped 22 times and they landed from, you know, 32 inches off the ground and that kind of stuff. It's not as intense, but the chronic load can really add up. And this is the number one way when I say this being resistance training is the number one way for us to develop the tolerance and the capacity of our muscles, bones, tendons, and ligaments. That's great, Sam. Um, so, what if if you were starting today? So, what would be your sort of general thoughts on a framework for someone who's just started running or coming back to running after a hiatus? Maybe um, it's a mom who's had a, a couple of kids and busy and working and, and getting back into it. Um, what would be your framework just to at least get started with strength training? Yeah, I have this saying that my team kind of probably rolls their eyes at if I'm not looking, but uh, we got to start from the start, right? So, um, and and I'm not saying I coined that that saying by any means, but I, I use it a lot, that's for sure. And um, I think that's the biggest error that people make in in actually my my profession of prescription of exercise is uh, not taking the um, putting the gravity behind what happens if you skip steps. 
and saying, well, you've done a little resistance training before. Maybe you haven't, but I, I see you moving. You move pretty good. Let's start over here at step number four. I think you don't need to do steps one, two, three. And so not only is that not good physiologically because your tissues don't like it when you skip steps, they like to be gradually introduced to different new actions. But also with that, you, you end up um, setting up people for failure. So it becomes a little bit too much too soon. And then it becomes um, the easiest thing to say, never mind, because I, I knew that was going to you know flare up this thing or it was going to make me too sore and that kind of thing. So when I talk about starting from the start for anybody that is entertaining the idea of resistance training, whether it's specifically to um, help them to be more durable and, and perform better in running or not, it is the idea of how do you build the foundation of some of these key muscles, starting from your core, working out into your hips, into some of your upper body and, and, and then lower body from there. Uh, a lot of these things can be done on the floor, literally on the floor and um, working on loading some of the muscles that we would eventually potentially load with bands or dumbbells if you have access to them and that kind of thing. Um, but there's ways to load these things with body weight and, and on the floor where, Mark, as you know, um, some of our uh, warm-ups that we do with you and some of our even workout exercises that we do with you actually don't include equipment um, and are often some of the sneakier ones uh, that, that will get you. Uh, so I think that the, the way to look at that is, and, and I, again, keep sort of teasing this idea of I'm going I'm to paint a picture of what framework I look at, like what body areas that I like to load and that kind of thing. And we'll, we will get into that. I'll let you lead me into it when you're ready, Mark. But I think the big thing is it doesn't have to be a lot. I mean, if you put in 15 minutes, two to three times a week with some core floor work and some lower body uh, loading and strengthening things that you can literally do, literally do either with or without a, a mini band and things like that, Somebody who hasn't had that stimulus especially can can really see a big benefit right away. Um, I got off the phone this morning with Carmela. Carmela is um, in her 60s. Uh, she has not done resistance training. And she had had a couple of um, hip and knee surgeries over the years. And um, she's worked, uh, she started working with us in an online capacity about uh, two weeks ago. And it's, it's very, very new for her. It's also uh, a, a little bit of a new thing for many people to do training online. So you're not just showing up to a facility and you're working one-on-one -on -one with a coach who's just telling you what to do and giving you real-time feedback. So there's a, a big learning curve there. Carmela, in my check-in call with her this morning, could not believe that after four sessions, she's like, you're going to think I'm crazy. I, I, I think I feel my core in ways that I never have before. And I'm like, that's not crazy at all. Imagine if you had not been watering a plant for after you went and bought it at Home Depot, but then three months later you say, "Oh man, it's getting a little brown here. We gotta we gotta get something going. Let's give it some water." You would see a pretty quick response from that plant, likely by just watering it. And our muscles, our bones, our tendons, and our ligaments are no different. When you give it the stimulus that it deserves and, and needs, um, they can respond really quickly. So it doesn't have to be a lot, um, you know, 15 minutes, a couple of times a week at, at the start. And I always have people build habits the way that we are meant as humans to build habits, which is don't, don't try to do all of them all at once, right? So you want to just do things that almost feel like it's too easy. Is this even worth my time? And the answer is yes. If you're doing something and not nothing for resistance training, that's definitely better than than nothing. And so um, just kind of working your way up into that. And hey, if you stayed at that that dosage, that's great. If you say, you know what, I can do more than this. We could get up into 30 minutes per session twice to three times a week. Um, I often don't find that for anybody who's um, relatively active outside of doing some of their resistance training work, that you need to do more than even two times a week, 30 to 45 minutes uh, maximum. I think that's that's plenty as a ceiling for people that say, well, what's enough? So I think um, those, the, I, I don't know if that answered the question there, Mark. Yeah, I know, absolutely. I know with um, my own training, I, I'm doing two sessions per week, about 45 minutes per session. And I find for me, that's enough because I want to prioritize my running and cycling so while i still want the benefits of the strength training i don't want it to be my focus i still want to do the other things i love to do so absolutely um, i think that's spot on 
So we can take this a couple different ways. I have a couple more questions, but did, did you have a framework or like some exercises you wanted to show us or, or where do you want to take this? Yeah, that's great. So um, I, I, I over time realized what I was doing when I was prescribing exercise to runners was I was sort of prescribing exercises that would load these six specific areas of the lower body. So I went ahead and I just kind of labeled those six areas so that it became really clear to myself and our coaches, hey, if we're writing a program for a runner especially, we, we cannot miss these areas. And if we go back and do an audit on the program that we've designed for this person and we realize where they're, they're you know, this person's maybe having a breakdown of an area, injury area, something like that, like we cannot go back and say, oh, well, we forgot zone number four. We really didn't do anything for that area. So zone number one, uh, and these uh, sort of the six I call five plus one zones of lower body durability. And I'll, I'll get into kind of why I call it plus one in a second. But zone number one would be your foot, your ankle complex. So with that, it's your plantar fascia, your Achilles tendon, your calf muscles. Now, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more from the soft tissue standpoint, but it also includes your... Um, bones. So the long bones of your feet, the long, the bones of your ankles and the, the long bones of your lower leg. We often forget how important loading those bones are. So things that target this area, not only uh, target those soft tissues, but they also target those bony um, areas that are crit critically important for a runner or anybody. Um, so, and I'll kind of cover some exercises at, 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 um, after I go through the zones here that can, can, um, kind of help with some of each of those areas. But um, that that being zone number one, a critical zone for runners because that's where the foot hits the ground. And where the foot hits the ground, if there is something off there, if there's something not as uh, ha that doesn't have enough tolerance or capacity for uh, withstanding that moment of foot hit the ground, then um, things tend to uh, fall apart up the chain. Then we go up the back of the leg, we have the hamstring. So maybe people on this call have had sort of that either low nagging hamstring issue that is just lingering in the back of the knee. Um, maybe it's at times uh, people have tried to do a little bit of a hit or a sprint workout and it yeah, they get a tweak in the middle of the hamstring belly. And then a lot of times for runners though, they end up in that high hamstring, low glute kind of cranky, uh, achy, uh, tender tendonitis type of a, a feeling in that, in that area of the high tendon of the hamstring. So the mistake people make with any one of these zones, but especially hamstrings, uh, is that they often stretch them. They stretch them until the cows come home. And then they say, I, I promise I'm doing all the stretches, but I don't know what's going on here. Like I could stretch all day, every day. And the second I stand up from my stretches, my hamstrings are just as tight as usual. So a lot of times the missing piece to the puzzle ends up being they've never really done anything to strengthen the hamstrings. So a muscle group that is not regularly strengthened and feeling strong or has that, that, that doesn't have the capacity and the tolerance to do the activity that you're asking it to do will immediately default to tightness. So when you receive tightness in a muscle area, it's oftentimes that muscle area. This happens a lot at the hip flexors, which we'll get to in a moment. Tight, cranky, pinchy type feeling. That type of a feeling is often your body's way of saying, hey, you're asking me to do X, Y, Z, and you've only really prepared me to do X. And I, 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 don't, I don't like that. And I'm, I'm going to tighten up to protect myself, and I'm just constantly going to feel tight for you. So the hamstrings getting loading and strengthening is really key. Then we go um, uh, into zone three, which is the inner thigh adductor muscle group. So your adductors um, and, and kind of uh, you may have heard the groin muscles, those referred to as that. And those muscles are really commonly overlooked with um, especially running athletes and, and people that run because most of the time runners like they tend to do a lot of linear straight ahead stuff. Running is linear. Um, and then any training they do happens to be linear when you really look closely at it and that kind of thing. And so the interesting part, it's, it's, it's sort of like a boat that doesn't have a rudder. If you don't have strong adductors, the inner thigh muscles and AB ductors, the outer thigh muscles, um, your, your, your boat, it, it doesn't have a good ability to kind of stay on track and stay linear. So, um, 
it's really important to train outside of that linear plane, which is called the sagittal plane. And it's really critical to train and strengthen in the lateral plane, which is called the frontal plane. So this would be something like a, a lateral squat, um, different types of exercises, even again, going back to the first part of the conversation, there's exercises that you could do laying on your on the floor with your bottom on your side with your bottom leg that you simply are working to lift up to the sky. And we're working on those adductors. Um, many runners ignore that area. Zone number four, we get into the hip flexors. Super common for runners to say, I always have those high hip, pinchy, tight, cranky hip flexors. And we have to remember that when you, if we were to take a snapshot of you when you're running, it's essentially going to see kind of like that lateral view of a sprinter. And you can picture the one knee up in that action as the other knee is pushing down as it's propelling you away from the, the ground. But that one knee coming up is what sets yourself up for the that leg to then be the one that switches like a piston. And uh, it doesn't matter how fast you're running. It, that, that is the action. And, and it, you still have to be able to lift your leg into that piston-like action. Hip flexors get asked to do that. And most of the time, people are only stretching them. They're doing that common wall stretch where you you push one leg back and you 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 get into a split stance and you stretch that hip flexor out and it feels so good when you're doing it but then you stop and you go on to your next thing and you're like ah oh, it's still tight and cranky it's because you never strengthened it and those are muscles that we're asking to do quite a bit of uh, piston like work and um and so strengthening those hip flexors is a huge victory for a lot of runners um, when, once you start to add that strength into the right hip mobility and um then Zone number five here, you have the quads. I'm sorry, zone number uh, four. Uh, four would be the hip flexors and the quads. Five would be the patellar tendon and the quad tendon. So you kind of have this ropey thing that turns into your kneecap, and then you have another ropey thing that uh, the, the technical term there, uh, the ropey thing turns into the, your kneecap, then uh, turns into another ropey thing that attaches to your the front of your shin. That little ropey thing is a is a pretty thick tendon called the quad tendon on top and the patellar tendon on the bottom. And essentially that's what transmits force from your lower body up into your upper body and 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 your upper hips that propel you in those piston-like actions. So if those areas are not strong and they haven't been built up in durability, this happens a little bit more with jumping athletes, so the basketball players but they get that anterior, what's called jumper's knee. And it can happen with runners where the anterior knee pain right on that ropey thing, either above or below the, the patella, the kneecap um, becomes irritated. And, and again, many people prescribe quad stretches for that. And they say, ice it, rest it, stretch. Okay, I did that, it went away. But as soon as I went back to my running, it came back. Problem is we're not doing things to strengthen those tendons something as simple as a wall sit. So old school, people think, oh, some progressive team of, of strength training specialists like TD Athletes Edge, they wouldn't be doing something old school like wall sits, but it's such a great thing. It's so underutilized and all you need is a wall. So that's a great way to strengthen um, the quads as well as those quad and, and patellar tendons. So then we get into the plus one zone, and that one is very specific, and it's why I named it that um, in terms of when I do um, sort of talk about this framework to, to specifically runners, it's, it's really uh, running specific, is that lateral line. So the um, what's called the tensor fascia latte, latte muscle, and then that turns into your IT band. So everybody uh, has heard of the IT band and maybe had pain and tenderness and tightness in that area. Um, IT band syndrome is a commonly ter uh, a common term that's um, tossed around out there and di people are diagnosed with um, pain along that lateral line. Same exact thing is the, is the issue here. So many people, doctors, physical therapists, trainers are telling people foam roll it, stretch it, maybe throw a hot pack on there, uh, rest it, and then go back to your running. It should be okay. And it feels great when you do those things. Well, maybe not the foam rolling because that's excruciating at times, but uh, it feels good if you give it a rest. And then suddenly you go back to what uh, you were doing and boom, that pain is right back. We forget that that really fibrous IT band tissue is craving the ability to be strong and springy. 
So it should not be loose and stretched out anyways. We probably shouldn't be spending a ton of time stretching it. It's supposed to be really springy and give yourself the, it, it's meant to act with those patellar and quad tendons to propel you. So it has to be springy and, and um, we need to strengthen it. So, um, you know, that it, strengthening your IT band could be even doing a side plank. So doing a side plank the proper way, you're actually loading the bottom leg IT band. People just think of that as a core exercise and secondarily they feel it in their shoulder, but it's really a great way to load your IT band. Those are my five plus one zones of lower body durability. I know that's a lot and maybe more uh, detail on anatomy than people want to get into, but I just think that's a severely overlooked uh, way of thinking about how do we prepare the runner for running. That's great, Tim. I love it. Um, so I don't know if you, do you, are you in a position you can show some exercises or? Yeah, what I, think I, I think I can here. Um, let me see what I can do in terms of doing a little shimmy shuffle. And um, I would love to. So give me one second here. Yeah, and all good. Yeah, if there's a, an opportunity to show some of your favorite exercises or some of the ones you, you briefly touched upon. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Give me one, give me one second. Yep. And if anyone has any questions too, as we're, we keep progressing, if you want to write them in the chat, um, that would be great. And we'll try to try to get to as many as we can. And I've already got a few questions from the um, Mighty Networks community and via email. So there's definitely a few already in the queue, but uh, if you have any live here, oh, that would be awesome too. See, uh, let me see if I can uh, get this set up to where we can, uh, you guys can see me there. Okay. So um, let's see what this ends up looking like if I go back to the door there. Um, let's see. We can. Uh, can you see me okay there? <laughs> yeah, I can see you. Your your head's a little bit cut off, but that's okay. <laughs> we can see your body. Uh, yeah, yeah. So when we talk about the, um, and you can hear me, Mark. I can hear you. Yeah. Um, so when we talk about that foot ankle complex, there, one of the easiest things. Again, pretty traditional in nature, but thinking about an exercise where you're using the wall for support. And we're going to strengthen we're going to bring one knee up and you're just going to work on a heel raise up to the top position and down three seconds so that's a very easy one another one is working on with hand support behind you or not for some balance component is a three-way heel raise so you can see my toes i think you can see my toes are pointing straight ahead here i'm yeah. going to do 10, 10 reps straight i'm going to do 10 reps out to the side i'm going to do 10 reps in. So that's going to get all three angles of the Achilles and calf muscles, which so many people have some level of uh, injury and or tightness in that area. So that's a great way to get that zone one. And while we're here, I would also say this is an awesome exercise for runners. So, so many runners have some of that, that shin splint type pain. And um, especially as you're getting going, you're adding, you're getting new shoes, you're, you're doing a new stimulus, you may have changed surfaces of what you're running on, you get that pain in the front or on the inside of the shins there. So there's some muscles that are there that we never ever strengthen, uh, but this is a great way to do it. So we call it the penguin. So you're literally gonna pull your toes up and out of your shoes, or if you're barefoot there, just pull your toes up and out to the sides there as you kind of march. So even just trying to do that for, 30 to 45 seconds, you'll feel the burn in those muscles. You'll build up their tolerance. It's such a great way to build um, lower leg endurance and, and uh, durability. So those are two great ones for that sort of zone one-ish type area. Zone two, we get into the hamstrings. So you may have seen an exercise like a one leg RDL. Mark, you and I do plenty of variations of these, but just working on the loading of that and even using a hand on something in front of you so it doesn't have to be all about the balance that's great if you want to work on that but to work on the strength you can see even just having to load my body weight i'm strengthening this muscle here the hamstrings 
You can also do that with dumbbells eventually as you build the endurance of that. But even before you work towards doing that on one leg, try an exercise where you're holding five to 15 pound dumbbells. And then you're going to just hold those right down the inseam of your legs. So, Mark, you had uh, tipped me off to some of the great questions that came out ahead of time. One of them was, is it okay if I do these every time I walk past my microwave during my day because um, I don't have time to do 45 minutes of training all at once? If 15 times a day you did one of these with five pound dumbbells, that's awesome, right? So again, this is back to like, what do you have time for? What's your starting point? Something is better than nothing and this doesn't have to be complicated. So those are great ways to load and strengthen those hamstrings when most people are just being, doing the stretches like, ah, I, I stretch them all day, it's not doing anything for me. <clears throat> so that's a great option right there for that zone number two. Zone number three, let me see if I can get a little bit closer down on the floor here. So this is one of the ones I was alluding to and I can put a visual to it now. So we're just gonna cross one leg over and then lift this leg up. So here we're working on the adductors of this leg and you can work on hovers, you can work on this. Excellent way without any equipment required to work on those adductors there. <clears throat> and then with the hip flexors, one of the things that we love is, as Mark knows, is our, our sprinter series of exercises. So our sprinter series is literally taking, say a mini band, one of those looped small bands, putting it around the tops of your, your shoelaces, using something to stand on and then just drawing one leg up. You could picture the band going into a stretched resistance position there from one foot to the other. And now I'm strengthening this hip flexor here. So just, you can picture me doing this. Yes, exactly, there's the minivan. So that's around the, the laces there. And you could picture me even laying on the ground and doing this as I dr drag my knee towards my chest. So those are great ways to develop strength in those areas. As we talked about, a good old fashioned wall sit here is a great way to kind of build strength and stability in the quads and these tendons here. Work up towards 45 to 90 seconds, and you can even hold a dumbbell here if you feel like that gets too easy. Um, it doesn't matter how low you can get. I've had people say, well, I can only hold it for 30 seconds, but I'm way up here and what a waste of time. Not at all, you could start there. You could work your way down an inch every week and all of a sudden you'll be down here and you'll build, be building up that tolerance and capacity. So that's a great option right there with that. Um, that covers the quads, the hip flexors, the patellar quad tendons. And then again, like I said, the IT band, really cool way, but commonly used way, not always recognized way of loading the IT band is just, you can imagine here in a side plank, even if you're just working with knees bent, right? So start here. This is such a good way to load that bottom leg here, down here, the IT band. Now you can work from here. Now I'm working this one here and I'm getting my core. So it's a great way to build that bang for your buck in all of those areas. Um, but that gives you an idea of how you would load all six zones. That's awesome, Tim. So um, is it cool? Do you want to, uh, got time to do some questions now? Yeah, let's rock with it. Okay, I got one from Brenda, and Brenda, maybe you can jump on to clarify, but Brenda says, how to practice strengthening your body with rotator issues? She said side plank would be an issue. It, oh, Brenda's here. Maybe she can clarify. Um, take your mic off mute there. There she is. Okay, hey. So um, I have torn rotator, uh, and uh, I'm comfortable lifting weight. I love lifting weights, but... Thanks to you, I realize I've been doing it incorrectly. <laughs> so hey, you've been um, doing it, you're 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 ahead of many people. So it's just a matter of kind of fine-tuning. So don't don't worry about that. Well, my goal, my goal, I'm in my late 60s and retired. Thank you, Mark. I'm looking forward to trying to run. And I have physical challenges. So I take a note, but how can I work with that hip flexor, the side plank? I'm not able. That is such a good question. So what we, uh, our team at TD Athlete says, what we do is we identify through an assessment before we work with anybody, 
we would identify and peel out ahead of time. Oh, this person has had either a cranky shoulder, had a rotator cuff surgery, anything like that. You're absolutely right. Nine out of 10 people with any sort of a shoulder history of any kind are not going to love that side plank. So first of all, very, very common. And then what do we do in that uh, place though? So one of the ways to load that lateral line there without going into a side plank is to use your mini band and, and work on, if you can imagine, I'm at a countertop, I've got my mini band on my ankles and I'm working on strengthening and you can see this way, I'm just working on just those lateral leg lifts. Another one would be to have the mini band above the knees and work on some lateral mini band walks back and forth this way. So those are great ways to load that. Um, the other thing I would add is another option and a, a great exercise. One of the most critical exercises I would say for runners that I didn't necessarily touch on, but it's not necessarily even part of the five plus one zones of lower body durability, but it's farmer carries and suitcase carries. So those are exercises where you are literally holding either one dumbbell like a suitcase or two dumbbells like a farmer holding buckets and you're just walking. So the reason why that's so good, whether this is five pounds or 55 pounds, it doesn't matter. You're taking more than your body weight and asking your hips and your knees and your spine and your core to organize themselves and to be loaded in one step at a time, which if we sped that up, that's obviously running, right? So we're loading your body in the fundamental patterns of single leg stepping actions so so good for for all those things that's such a good question brenda and uh yeah way to, way to already have the habit built and um it, yeah it's uh good on you for uh just keep chipping away okay thanks brenda uh, okay we got another question from jody here um jody asked how important is it to strengthen the pelvic floor especially for female runners having pregnancies hysterectomy etc absolutely so there are specialists who really delve deep into the nuances of kind of working on the, the muscles of the smaller muscles of the pelvic floor, um, all of that area. Now, I find, and I would always defer to any of those people that that is the day in, day out work that they do, but our pelvis is kind of that, if you, if you think of that as the, the bony pelvis where all the muscles of the core do attach in on. Also, from the bottom up, all the muscles of the legs of, of sort of the off of the femur and then up into the, the pelvis there all attach in on there. So it's quite an intersection of some very, very critical, important muscles for runners, for any humans. Um, we want to think about having some core awareness. So the first place I start, and again, I would, this is very, very elementary first step to having some pelvic awareness is what I would say. Uh, is something like a cat cow or a cat camel as some people call it. <clears throat> the way that we teach a cat cow is I want you to imagine that you have a dial on your hips. So many people do a cat cow and they actually do a lot of motion from up here. They're not actually learning the awareness. As you can see here, I'm now using the dial of my hips. It's coming from my pelvis as I do that. So looking up, breathing in, and then tucking my tailbone, breathing out. So it's coming from the pelvis. That's one great way to start that. And 100%, you bring up a really key point because one thing that we work on with runners, how do we get your hips from down below and your core in the mid torso section area to be operating as one as you propel yourself forward with your legs? So the exercises that we have, for instance, and we'll get into some of the programs that we offer, strength for runners and things like that, where so many of those exercises are things that are maybe similar to something that people have seen like a dead bug, but there are a little spin and twist on them. But those exercises are great because they're helping you to get your hips and your core in a symphony, as I call it. So if those two areas are strong, but not in a symphony, then there's a disconnect. And that's where running can become less efficient. If you can make that connection and get them in a symphony, it can be so key. So in a roundabout way, that, that answers your question. The, the answer is yes, you should focus on the nuanced muscles of the pelvis and the pelvic floor are very, very critical. Thanks, Jody. Um, Luther, 
Uh, Hi. Okay, Luther's got his hand up for a question here. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. I got you. Howdy, Luther. Okay. Uh, hi. I, I go by Lee, but that's fine. Um, hi, Lee. Hi. Hi. Thanks. I'm enjoying it. So, real quick. So, a few weeks. I'm 68 years old. A few weeks ago, I was going to uh, went to an orthopedic surgeon. Had pain coming up my leg, and I was diagnosed with a little bit of arthritis in my right knee, and then also a little bit of men meniscus tear on the outside due to aging. And so uh, he also noticed I was very tight. He says, just find exercises, you know, to for hamstrings, whatever. But he says, your running days are over. And I just refuse to believe that. So um, but he said, he could, um, I, I'm going to go get a second opinion in a few weeks. But um, in listening to you today, I was just wondering, and, and all I've been doing is, I mean, it's the pain was it's slowly subsiding. But all I've been doing is just stationary cycling and doing some stretching. He recommended yoga, um, which I can do all that. But are, do you think, uh, and I'm, I'm going to get a second opinion from another um, orthopedic surgeon that was recommended to me by a college track coach here in, in Dallas. But um, real, I know that's real quick, any information on that, especially for a guy that's pushing 70, but this just cannot, I've been running my whole life. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, uh, at the risk of sort of, I obviously would want to learn more a little bit about your particular case and, and anything that was either imaged or diagnosed there or any surgical history, which right. I'm happy to circle up with you after the fact, we could easily sort of uh, check in and, and I can delve deeper there with you. But at, at face value, I think this is a really critical question. Again, this is back to that idea of what I talked about. Nobody is driving around with a brand new car off the lot. Um, anybody's tissue at the age and stage of, of any of us would, you could do an image of them and they would have some level of wear and tear. That is natural. Right. It's, it's like uh, if I were to grow my hair out, I've got some white in my hair, right? I mean, our hair ages, it changes. Our joints age, they change. It does not mean that is a death sentence for your running days. It doesn't mean it's a death sentence for your knees. Um, I think that every meniscus and every arthritic case is a little different. Some are symptomatic, some are not. I mean, we could do imaging on 10 people your age and stage, and it could show similar wear and tear, but they may not be symptomatic where you are. The reality, is, the, the, the point is you're symptomatic, so why is that? Have we done everything we can to build the strength in and around the knee, uh, above the knee and the hips, get your core working in the same action? What happens if we do that? I mean, I've seen people with what you've described be given a prognosis that is you got to stop impact sports be able to defy that so um it, you know i definitely would want to delve into your case and i think that many people look at those tissues as as i said before static and they say it just is what it is i can't change my meniscus it is what it is i can't change my the joint surfaces and that's actually fundamentally wrong <laughs> you can you can change the quality of those tissues if done correctly now, can we get them to a point where they're not asymptomatic, where you could tolerate running? Uh, quite possibly. I, maybe, maybe not. But I think it's it's always something where so many people are guided down a path of like, look, you just have to end it and go do something else or else I'll have to do surgery. Yeah. And it doesn't always have to be that way. And I think that many people get brought to that point a little too fast without trying the right prescription of strength. What I would say to you, Lee, is something like a wall sit. Something like a wall sit would be a great way to load some of those knee structures without any dynamic squatting action. So if you think about what a wall sit is, if you imagine my back against the wall here, that's a static squat, right? Dynamic squat would be this. Those dynamic versions of the squat may very well irritate some of your tissues. So what, what does a wall sit look like? Yeah. yeah, so the wall sit, let me get this a little bit better, is literally as it sounds find a flat spot on the wall and now i'm supported fully back here so i'm, I'm against the wall right here uh -huh. and i'm just in this seated position regardless of i don't have to get way down here by any means so whatever depth feels comfortable for you lee i would say hey work up to 90 plus seconds uh, a couple times a day on building the strength here isometric strength so static strength building is so key when some of those tissues do have any sort of degenerative changes in them, which by the way is very normal. So yeah. I would start with that and then um, Mark will pass along any info uh, where you could reach out and I can have okay. 
hopefully help help further. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Now, Lee, Lee, if you want to pop me an email, I'm sure you've got my email address. Yeah. Yeah. Just pop me an email and I can connect you with Tim. If you want to ask other questions, whatever. Okay. Unfortunately. Uh, okay. Um, what else we got here? I'm just looking through a list of questions. Um, Trine from Denmark asks um, about any exercises or tips that are more gentle on her knees uh, than squats are. Um, she says uh, squats are really hard for her knees uh, due to a lack of cartilage. Absolutely. So the first place I would go is exactly what I was just talking about with Lee is your, your wall sit. That's such a great way. Static versus dynamic, right? Now, where I'm going to go is since I've already shown the wall sit, that's a, that's a train. That's a great place to start. Start with your wall sits. But then if you think about it, many people with this type of a knee um, history will also say that lunges or split squats are very uncomfortable. So when I talk about a lunge or a split squat, I'm talking about somebody doing this type of an action and you go to a trainer and they have you do, you know, three sets of 30 of them and you're trying your best. And then by the end of the session, you can't even walk. Right. So you don't have to do those dynamically the way I just showed. You could do them statically or isometrically, and that only that simply looks like this. Even using your hand on support on a countertop and sinking down here like this. One of my clients right now, Lori, Lori is working on, uh, has a knee history, and um, she is literally working on the height of her split squat right now today is like this. And it started off that she could not even get into this position, right? So we, we're here. I expect that in three months, she'll be down here and comfortably holding this position. Well, you can do 15 to 30 second holds on this, building the strength here, building the strength here, helping to load these muscles here. Those are such great ways to work on those running support beam muscles. That's great, Tim. Uh, okay, I've got another one here um, from Denise. She suffers from migraines and positional headaches, so she's limited primarily to standing exercises. Uh, can you recommend any beginner-friendly band exercises or standing exercises to replicate the gains in glute bridges, planks, and clamshells for runners? Oh, yeah, this is a really good one. So one of my favorites for runners, and it is a core component of our program called Strength for Runners and, and kind of how we prescribe exercise to runners. So it's called a stork. So the stork would be an exercise here. If you could imagine that I am literally standing next to a wall on, on this leg. So the wall is here. I am right up on that wall. And, and my hand here is a wall against my knee. So I'm going to push into that wall. I'm going to hold this position, but I'm pushing hard here. I'm not actually going to go anywhere because hopefully that wall is sturdy and reinforced. But what I'm doing is I'm actually loading this leg here. I'm loading the strength and mostly this outer glute. So for me to do this, to push into the wall here and to stay in place, this outer glute away from the opposite from the wall is going to be on fire. So you'll get a little quad and a ton of that lateral glute. Again, the reason why I love a stork for many runners to start in, you're loading that lateral glute, which is critical, but you're doing it in a static way, where if you've had any injury history on ankles, knees, hips, you're not dynamically going in and out of a lot of range of motion, which could irritate those things. So if you were to hold that stork for 15 to 30 seconds, you're going to be on fire on that lateral glute. And then for you, you're not having to go down to the ground or do bridges and side planks and things like that. That could irritate some of the postural migraine stuff that you're dealing with. Great question, um, Denise. Uh, okay, we got one from Kylan. And Kylan says, I struggle with plantar fasciitis pain when I start running again. So I'd love any information on preventing that. Yeah, it's, it's so, so common uh, with runners. And this is probably one of the most commonly misprescribed, let's say, where people get told to put a lacrosse ball under there, roll it out. They get told to stretch it out, like the old school calf stretches. Just put that leg back and stretch that plantar fascia out. Um, people are even told to just dig your fingers in there and maybe ice it. It'll hopefully take care of itself. So the problem there is the, the fascia that we're talking about is doesn't have a great blood supply. But the great thing is it's a tissue that can actually turn into 
um, it, a better quality of itself. It, it's not a static tissue. It can change. The way that you do that, you can see a theme building here, is you strengthen it. Um, so the stretching piece is going to really actually be not what you want to do. Your plantar fascia, again, like your IT band we talked about earlier, is actually meant to be really springy and help propel you. So if we're sitting here stretching it out all the time, that's actually defeating the purpose of its function. And so um, not that you can't do a little bit of stretching and that feels good and to, you know, you know, be able to complement that with plenty of strengthening is great. But many people just stretch, 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 stretch. You're actually um, potentially hurting, setting yourself up for other negative things. Um, the other thing that's uh, misdiagnosed or misunderstood about plantar fasciitis is it's not actually an itis. So it, it often blanketly gets termed as an inflammatory itis type issue. Reality, that tissue doesn't often get inflamed. That tissue actually is just beginning to break down. So what we need to do is not decrease its inflammation because that's not even what's going on. We need to actually change the breakdown in the tissue and make it have a, a tissue that doesn't have great blood supply get blood supply because that's how tissues heal and become more robust. So the best way to do that, um, you could take a little towel. I think I have something here. Um, you can literally take a towel like this and kind of roll it up into a bit of a towel roll there. So you've just got something there like that. And then I'll get this down just a touch so we can see. So what you want to do is you want to get, that should show, okay. So the ball of my foot here is in front of the towel roll. roll. The, my big toe is with that towel roll is actually lifting up my, my it's underneath there, it's, it's lifting up my big toe. And then from there, what I'm trying to do is just do a heel raise. So I'll move my other leg out of the way. So I'm just doing a heel raise there where my big toe is extended or stretched. The reason why that's critical is it puts your plantar fascia, if this is my foot and this is my plantar fascia underneath, when I put my big toe on a stretch like that, it stretches this out. So then when we strengthen that in a stretched position, it loads that tissue and brings a ton of blood supply to the area. So you're actually changing your tissue. You're not just stretching it out and crossing your fingers. Thanks, Tim. That's great. Um, okay, you got time for what, a couple more? Or? Lock and roll. This is great. Good questions. Uh, okay, well, there's one from Amy here, and she she basically wants to know what's sort of the best protocol for pre and post runs. She's wondering, like, should she stretch before runs or dynamic stretch or do the stretching after or stretch at all? Um, love to hear your take on that. Yeah, so in our program, Strength for Runners, we have some um, uh, specific pre-run uh, warm-ups that are designed to answer this exact question with actual exercises and protocols. And uh, what we did was sort of have one designated for a medium length run, one for a longer run, one for a quick, short, more intense run, that kind of thing. So try to really target the movements and the intensity of the movements towards the type of run you're about to do. Um, but the bottom line is, it, Let's not overthink this. <laughs> you, I, I think that the key is you do want to do some warm up. You do want to do some movement. You don't have to overdo it. You don't have to warm up for 30 minutes, but you want to do some warm up. Uh, you can start with some static stretches, you know, the old school, just kind of reach down and touch my toes. That's not a problem, but you don't want to just do that. So you want to, if you're going to do some static stretches because you're used to that, that feels good. That's great. Keep doing it, but finish those off or then. To some dynamic stretches so for instance a great dynamic stretch to get your hamstrings right instead of just bending over to sitting on one leg and that figure four kind of reach to touch my toes action i can get into a yoga pike position here and stretch out my hamstrings as i go into that so that will be more of a dynamic stretch as i'm working on that action right there um, but the point is we have sort of to think about how we format our, our warm-ups we will go from um, the floor to standing position and, and kind of start on the floor where we do some core and floor, as we call it, floor and core. And then we go from sit to stand or kneel to stand. So finally, we go from jump to land. So core and floor, sit to stand, and then core and then jump to land. Now, jump to land doesn't mean you have to do a bunch of 
plyometric jump, box jump exercises or crazy stuff. That could literally mean that you finish your warm up with something called a drop squat. So I'm going to start here and I'm just going to, as if I were hopping to the ground, just go there. So you're going there. So what you're doing there is you're preparing these tissues to be able to run and move forward and have some impact loaded into them. There's some great ways, but thinking about the format of it, I do recommend a more, a bigger emphasis on the dynamic stretches. Um, one of the greatest stretches that's out there is what we call a Spider-Man. And so you kind of get into this position here and you just kind of open up in that position. Now, if you cannot get to that floor position, put your hands here. You could just work on this. And then what you're doing is you're gonna switch legs. You're gonna get a great hip flexor stretch. You're gonna open up this way here. Again, you can see that as long as I can kneel on one knee, I don't have to go crazy and get way down here if that hip mobility doesn't work for me. There's always an ability to scale an exercise to your starting points. You just have to have the right co-pilot or know kind of where and how you make that decision. Okay, uh, Karen raised her hand. So Karen, are you there? You have a question? Hi, Karen. I think you're on mute. Uh, yeah. Oh, how's there that? Hi, Karen. Uh, so, sorry? I hear you. Hi. Okay, great. Hi. In terms of recovery, just wondering about your recommendations regarding the timing of the strength training versus your longer, more intense runs, because I've been told different things, but I typically do my strength training the day before my long run as opposed to the opposite because I feel better, but I don't know what's better regarding interference with recovery from either one of those activities so could you give me some uh, pointers on that thanks absolutely yeah thank you so much karen so the the sort of easiest answer from my end is to say doing what you're doing sounds like it's working because you literally said that it feels better that way our body will tell us the answer it's like well how's that working for you isn't it is a question that i'll often ask people what does the science say? What do a couple studies say over here? Well, it says this. I'm happy to sort of share that and I'll get into it. But then, you know, don't mess with something that's working as well. Most of the time, what I find is that if we're talking about resistance training on the same day, which I know you're not necessarily, uh, your, your case was, should I do? I would say yes. I think that's an appropriate, not only is it working for you, so stick with it, but that's probably how I would do it. After your long run, if you did your long run on, say, Wednesday and then tried to do resistance training on Thursday, you may really kind of undermine your ability to get the most out of that resistance training session versus if you're going to resistance train on Wednesday, as long as that's not, not going to Im impact you from a sort of standpoint, you may even be potentiating or turning on your body and preparing it to run the next day. Um, I don't want to interfere with my runs. That's exactly. all because my runs are the most important for me. And so, like, if I do a major strength training the day before, is that going to impact? But so far, like you said, like that's how I feel the best. It hasn't uh, proven a detriment. So, yeah, thanks. So, no, yeah, continue right. that. <laughs> yeah, continue Thank that. Thank you. No, you're welcome. And I would say for anybody that is thinking uh, slightly different case where you're you're talking about could I strength train on the same day? That is okay as long as it works for you again, okay. but you order them in the same order, but now the, the time between is, is less. So if right. you're strength training on the same day, I would still recommend you would do strength training first and then run second. You, if you reverse that and you run first, you could be so exhausted by the time you get to your strength training session that you're gonna really undermine your ability to get safely the most out of the resistance training. Whereas Strength training first can actually warm you up and and potentiate activate you for your run. So uh, I think good really, point. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question, and um, the order of it can make a big difference. Great, thank you so much. Great question, Karen. Um, okay, Tim, got a couple more quick ones. Yeah. Okay, uh, Mallory asks. It's kind of a two-parter. Uh, are there any exercises to avoid as a runner, if any? And then there part two is what's the deal with HIIT workouts? Do they increase the risk of injury due to their quick movement using weights? Right, right. Uh, exercises to avoid with a runner. I would say exercises to avoid with a, a human. And and really the answer to that is any any exercise that you're having pain, not, not work, muscles working type of 
um, you know, soreness or, or feeling like that, but actual five plus out of 10 pain, uh, that could be very different for any people. So from, for anybody. So, um, I, I always have this saying too, where there's a lot of great exercises out there. There's a ton of great exercises. It does not mean they're all great for every person. So I, I, I think that with that, no, there's not one exercise that I say, oh, as a runner, I would never, ever do this. It was always case by case basis. Um, there are certain exercises, for instance, Olympic style lifting. We don't usually keep or hold utilize in our methodology um, because we feel like we can accomplish certain gains uh, that they would bring in other ways that are less um, costly from a risk reward standpoint. So, um, you know, there's certain exercises like a barbell back squat that I would tend to try to show somebody three to five other options that you could accomplish something similar versus loading the spine in a potentially negative way. Um, so those would be a couple that I wouldn't say even specific to runners, but for humans in general, I think there's other ways we can accomplish those things, but there's plenty of people that do those things and are fine. So it just Matt, depends on, on the person. Um, the second part of the question being it, what's the deal with the hit workouts? Um, are they, I think it was, are they good for the joints? Yeah, basically, uh, yeah, I can't try to find the, oh yeah. What's the deal? With, do they increase the risk of injury due to their quick movements using weights? Yeah. So that's along the lines of what I was alluding to there with something like an Olympic style lift. And there is a risk reward that does in, in the risk increases with an exercise that is of such high complexity and high intensity with weight. So unless you're very, very skilled at that action and that skill of, of lifting the weight that style and, and doing some of those more explosive style jumps, landings and, and high intensity exercises, I find that most of the time we can accomplish things. Um, even like a kettlebell swing is a really common one that a lot of people in my industry fall in love with because it does have a lot of benefit. But the reality is for a lot of people, it can create some not great feelings on the pelvis and, and the spine, especially if you're not doing it right. And these are types of exercises that tend to be really, really complex. So what that means is unless you've been taught the right way to do these for, for, for a very long time and honed your skill at them, they're really easy to do incorrectly and only doing them slightly incorrectly can make a big problem. Um, and so I think that maybe some of those high intensity type exercises get a bad rep because, um, they're just not being coached the right way. Uh, and the reality too, is that for some people, they just not, may not be the right way to get what you're trying to do. And there's always a way to scale into something that could accomplish something similar, but without the negative impacts of it. Yeah. I, I've actually never liked hit workouts. I like they're, they're, I know they're, they're popular because you're kind of combining the endurance aspect with the strength all in one. So it's a quick hitter, but I've always preferred to keep my endurance and strength compartmentalized and separate because I enjoy them more that way. And I can focus on them more as opposed to doing a strength movement while you're tired and you get lazy and poor form. So that that's one of the reasons that I like just to keep it separate. No, it's such a good point, Mark. And I, if you train with us and Mark knows this all too well, is we tend to use a lot of tempos. We tend to use a lot of what we call ECCs or eccentric. So we'll put into an exercise, uh, push up with three second eccentric or a split squat, like I showed earlier with five second eccentric or a five second ISO at the bottom. Meaning we want you to go five, four, three, two, one, or we want you to get to the bottom and hold for five, four, three, two, one. Um, I think a lot of people go through reps pretty quickly. So one of the benefits of doing this resistance training is the amount of time that you're getting under tension for those load bearing structures to receive the stimulus. And so if we reduce that amount of time and we kind of fly through the reps, uh, there is a, let's call it a heart rate effect of that, which if that's your objective, by all means. But if that's not your, your, your number one objective and you're trying to get to these support structures and muscle strength and, and the other benefits of resistance training, actually slowing it down and owning the actions um, can be massively beneficial. Yeah. Um, okay. I think we're uh, being conscious of time. Um, just like to know anyone else who's on the call now have any questions before we wrap, wrap this up and let Tim get on with the rest of his day. You can either come on the video or type it in the chat. Can I ask one more question? Let's do it, Brenda. Yeah, Brenda. Okay. Okay, so 
I live in an 11th floor apartment complex. We've had fire alarms a couple of times. When I get done walking down the 11th floor, not warming up and everything, I can barely sit down the next day. I want to be able comfortably to do the stairs. What would be the warm up to be able to do that? Yeah, great. Um, so we have an exercise called a continuous step up. So you literally need one step, one stair to do this. And okay. All you're going to do is just simply at a comfortable pace, just step up if you can imagine, and then step back down. Now, if you pay attention here, you, you're seeing me step up with my left and then step down with my left. So what I would do is say you work up to doing two to three minutes of left foot up, left foot down, and then you would change and go two to three minutes of right foot up, right foot down. So that's Got it. A, yeah, that's a really great way to build that up. The other thing that this brings up is is a, probably a whole other topic for us, Mark, on a different day, but is how do you really pay attention to um, increasing and progressing through either running volume or training volume? Yeah. So, yeah. So how do you do that? The easy, quick answer, we'll do a whole other day with this, uh, Mark, and I'll, I'll follow your lead. But uh, easiest, quickest way to think about that is uh, start at 40% of what you could do if you did your max effort one day. And over the course of a four to six week period, you're going to increase by 10% of the volume of that work. Okay. So if you think about it from the stair example there, Brenda, you're thinking about the max goal is 11 floors, no soreness. We'll work up, you know, start down at like, you know, doing five floors, something like that. And then each week you add a floor, right? And, and so over four to six weeks, you're going to have increased about 10% there. You'll get up to that 11th floor. And the same thing goes for uh, your, your training, your resistance training. The same thing goes for if you're trying to work up and, and kind of get some, some running volume going. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mark. You're welcome. Absolutely. Thanks, Brenda. Welcome. Uh, Okay, so if that's it, we're going to get wrapped up. But uh, Tim, before we go, well, quickly, I want to say thank you. This has been super helpful for me and everyone here on the call and to others. We'll, we'll share this recording with the Nun Run community, and I'm sure they get a lot of benefit out of it. But where can people either get in contact with you or find out more about you or find out about your, your Run Strong program and, and every, everything else you do? Yeah, that's great. So um, on Instagram at TD Athletes Edge, have uh, taken a little calculated kind of uh, social media breather for a little while. And in some ways, that's been uh, amazing, as we all know, with social media could get to be a lot. But I'll be back there more regularly. But there's a tremendous amount of content there of many of those posts that if you scroll down in the archives and the um, a, a, on, on that channel on at TD Athletes Edge on Instagram, you'll see tons and tons of posts with three to six exercises that are bite-sized little examples of either running specific or just lower body strengthening specific exercises of these exact durability areas that we talked about today. That's a great place. Um, our website, www.tdathletesedge.com. And you can either reach out uh, there and the contact us. You can reach out uh, on a direct message on Instagram there, uh, any of those areas. But we are really excited about our um, program that we developed and, and put together specific to runners. So um, we do have one that is uh, that, that does combine both a volume prescription as well as the 12 weeks of strength and conditioning for a beginner running uh, so for a runner who's beginning to introduce strength training and wanting to know the right way to do that, it's packed with a couple of workouts that are five plus one. So those five plus one zones of loading plus your core, it's packed with 12 weeks of regular workouts. Um, it, it's it's a, a, a program that's designed to help you to, like I said, start from the start. Um, and then we have a, a version of that if it, you know, you're not necessarily looking for, which many of you will not necessarily need the prescription of um, how much running I should be doing to get started, but I am just looking for the strength piece. So we call that strength for runners. And so we get you started into our app called True Coach that we use. And then you're basically running that program on your own. Um, and it's, it's, it's very, very easy to kind of get started and follow through every exercise has an instructional video by, from myself and, and our team of how to do it the right way, what to look out for, that kind of thing. 
and you can even track your progress in that program. So um, definitely reach out to us, but um, you can you can find that um, right on our website there. And, and uh, that's again, www.tdathletesedge.com. And I'll probably give the link to our landing page for the program right to Mark as well, um, where he can blast that out. But uh, yeah, those are great ways. And then for anybody looking for any more of the customized strength training where you have maybe a history of injury or um, a, a more generalized program just for runners is not quite as specific as you were hoping to get to. Um, that is something that I work in a customized way as I do as, as Mark's coach, um, being able to really delve in in a very individualized and customized way. So our customized online training um, is, is a great option as well to kind of get started in, in that more individualized specific way. So please reach out, um, check in with us and uh, we would, Love to hear from you. One email you can use is our business email is tdteam, so tdteam at tdathletesedge.com. And our office manager, Cynthia, um, a.k.a. Chaps, will be on the other end of that. She'll loop me right in and we'll get you any answers to anything at all, but um, we'd love to hear from you. I put all the links in the chat for everyone else. And um, if you if you need them, you can always email me and I'll, I'll send you the right direction. Okay, thank you, Mark. And yeah, I really appreciate it. I hope it comes across. I really love helping people to kind of get to the bottom and sift through the noise that's out there when it comes to how to prepare the body. So it's, uh, it gives me goosebumps to be able to talk to everybody and, and uh, hopefully something 